Welcome to Future Explorations. I'm glad you can join us. My name is Victor Martinez, and this podcast is dedicated to the exploration of the diversity in perspectives around the concepts of change as a constant we humans need to embrace, long-term thinking as an approach for everything we should build and create, and the limits that our human nature, physiology, society, environment, and technology impose on us by their own intrinsic characteristics. It is your task and mine to identify the connections between all views, to discover the interdependence and complementarity of knowledge and ideas. In that way, we might get a clearer picture of what that sustainable future could look like and how we can design the transition to get us there. Today we have the honor of talking to Dr. Jacqueline Gill. Dr. Jacqueline Gill is an Associate Professor of Paleoecology at the University of Maine, where she holds a joint appointment with the School of Biology and Ecology and the Climate Change Institute. She directs the BEAST Lab, Biodiversity and Environment Across Space and Time, which applies diverse tools and study systems to understand how people, climate change and extinctions influence species and ecological communities across long timescales. She is also an active science communicator and podcaster in Warm Regards, where they have interesting conversations with newsmakers, researchers, activists, policymakers, artists, and others about life on a warming planet. And she is dedicated to improving diversity in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. Dr. Gill, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm so glad to have this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Excellent. Thank you so much. So um, I would like to start just by um, asking if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, something, uh, you know, from who you are and where you come from and why, why you end up where you are now and what kind of amazing, interesting stuff you're doing today. Yeah, so I'm a paleoecologist, which means I study how species and ecosystems respond to changes in climate, to extinction, but, you know, so the same sorts of things that an ecologist would do, but over very long time scales. And my research focuses mostly on the end of the last ice age, so roughly the last 20,000 years or so, um, where we have this really wonderful set of what we call natural experiments, uh, natural changes in climate people moving around the world uh, for the first time in in many cases, Um, and also the extinction of these really large animals like woolly mammoths and giant ground sloths. And all of these uh, all of these big events, this, this huge set of upheavals that happen in the earth system are really valuable for helping us to understand the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis today. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we will get into many of those points, but I will start uh, so my, my approach is, is to start like in a very basic, um, <clears throat> because um, my audience, I'm, I'm trying to address an audience that is a general audience, so no specialist in biology or anything. So I would like, if you, if you don't mind, um, I did some, 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 some research, um, you know, the terminology, that, that the definition of paleoecology that you just gave us is, is absolutely great. Um, but I, I just, there's something that I've been, I've been, you know, going around my head for many years since I did my PhD, when I went back to read about biology and my mind was blown away, um, that um, the definition that I found about paleoecology is interactions between organisms and organisms and, and, and their environment. Mm-hmm. And it struck me that in, on geologic times, geologic timescales, that's the other part, I'm sorry about the definition. Um, and I would like to start with the uh, organisms part, if you don't mind. I know it's probably not in your in your area of expertise, but in 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 your in your in your knowledge, organisms means that are alive. Isn't yes. It? Yes. And what I found is that it's not as easy to as people may think to define what alive means. So, mm. what what would you say from your perspective? Could you help us understand what how how biologists draw the border between what is alive and what is not alive. Ooh, you have you have stumbled into a great debate okay. <laughs> in biology. And this actually has a lot of relevance to to the world right now because 
<laughs> at the crux of this debate is the question of whether viruses are alive. Right. And we are in a global pandemic that's caused by a virus. And um, and, you know, we know viruses reproduce, but they can't reproduce on their own. And that's one of the basic tenets of life is something that is able to replicate itself in some way. So we have our genetic code, which is the blueprint that builds our bodies. Um, and, you know, plants have have this animals have this fungi, you know, it's, it's universal across living things. But then if you look at a virus, a virus is not able to reproduce on its own. It has, uh, it lacks the necessary structures that uh, it's not able to, to accomplish that. And so it's literally hijacking our bodies and our own cells in order to do that on its own. And similarly, cancer is, is, is a case where you have um, these sort of runaway uh, responses where our own cells become distorted and, and used against us. Um, and so these questions of, of what is a living thing, um, you know, they really get at you know, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you know, it when you see it, right. I know that a rock is not alive, but I know that uh, a plant, you know, a tree is alive and that rock may contain tiny fossils. It may be made up of organisms that were once alive, um, mm -hmm. you know, many millions or tens of millions of years ago. Um, but when we get to that cellular level, these questions about how do you, how do you define life actually become remarkably philosophical and yes. Yeah. So does something have DNA? Does something have um, the ability to exist on its own um, and replicate itself? And, uh, and so, yeah, these, it's, it's not actually a simple answer. Um, but fortunately, um, it's not debated for any of the things that I work with. <laughs> so I never have to, I never, I never get called to answer that question unless I'm, you know, in an introductory biology class yeah. and then students, it kind of blows their mind. They're like, wait a minute, we don't, we, we're not sure if viruses are alive or not. Um, so. Yes, no, exactly. That, that's my point. Um, because the last time I had a, a biology class was in high school. And then I read again about biology when I was doing my PhD and my mind was blown away. Like, like people really should know much, much more about biology, um, especially economists and especially politicians. That's uh -huh. my, my personal opinion. Oh, I agree um, with you. 100%. So the, the other part, uh, again, thinking in our audience that may not be uh, aware, I'm, I, I was struggling with this, so I had to go through this process, it's, it's about this time scale. Mm. So you, you mentioned that your area of expertise, your work is within 20,000 years ago. But um, I would like to have a time reference, kind of a, a frame of reference. So starting with the basics, so just tell me if I'm wrong. Um, Earth has 4.5 billion years old. Yes, roughly. that's correct. Uh, life has started around 3.5 billion years ago. Right. And here, I, I know that some of our audience is going to come from a, from a non-English speaking and other countries with different cultures. So the billions, if, if you allow me to get all this also right. So we're talking about thousands of years, tens of thousands hundreds of thousands, millions of years, then we can be talking about hundreds of millions of years, but then we can be talking about thousands of millions of years. And that's what we refer with a billion. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. okay. Because and that, and yes. Yeah. And that's a huge number. It's a number that is hard to wrap your brain around. I mean, if you, yes. you know, we have something like 7 billion people on the planet now, and that's essentially one year for every two of them. Right. Yes. <laughs> and that's, that's a lot. Um, yes. And for most of that time, for, you know, another few billion years, all of that history of life was a single cell, right? We had, exactly. yeah, which is really, really fascinating. Exactly. That, that's something that, again, blew my mind. It's some, some really basic stuff of biology, but for a non-expert non like me, it's just like, wow. Um, I found that um, life went out of the oceans just roughly 390,000, no, million years ago. Mm -hmm. So we're saying that around 3.1 billion years, life was spent in the water. Yeah. Yep. The majority of life on earth is actually has taken place in the oceans. Um, we are a blue planet and that's not, that's true, not only in terms of the land surface, but also our, mm -hmm. the deep evolutionary history of life on earth. And those yeah. very first plants that colonized land or colonize is actually a tricky word. We're trying to get away from that for, for lots of reasons we can talk about, but yes. the very first plants to emerge and, and live on land had to face so many challenges because organisms 
uh, evolved in water. And so the very first challenge to life was how do you live on land without drying out? And that was not trivial for plants. They had to come up with some really creative ways to, um, to survive in these dry environments. And then of course, animals followed uh, a bit later and yeah, we spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about life on land, but, um, for, yeah. you know, billions of years, life was all about the oceans. Yeah, exactly. I, I think, uh, I don't know exactly how to communicate this, that really, really, you know, stays in people's mind and it's easy to understand how, how important the oceans are in this aspect, you no, know, on, on, on uh, the, the beginning of life and how, how dependent we are from, from that as well. Um, and the other, the other bit that I was looking at before, before I'm preparing for this interview, uh, the CO levels uh, in the atmosphere, obviously, is, is something that we need to discuss, but I was looking at the, uh, the records, and the oldest that I could find was 600 million years. Um, so I haven't been able to find anything uh, older than that in terms of, of uh, records of CO2 levels, and they were mm -hmm. around 4,000 uh, um, parts per million. Um, so the first question, I guess, is do we have something older than that as records, or why is it that we don't have any, any older Oh, that's, that's such a great question. Um, so if you think about it, where do we get our records of, of CO2? Ice cores and then deep ocean cores. And so the ice cores, they only go back a million or so years ago because at a certain point, the ice just wasn't there. Having ice everywhere on the earth or, or anywhere on the earth, um, especially at the poles is actually relatively recent when I, and I'm putting little scare quotes around recent because, you know, we're talking about these these very long geologic timescales. Um, but the earth has been slowly cooling for about 30 to 35 million years. Um, obviously we're reversing that trend now with our actions, but the permanent ice on the poles that we have now, North, North and South pole, that's only been, that's been kind of on and off for a couple million years. And then really in, a, in any kind of steady sense for just about a million or so years. And so actually accessing the ice that we can, you know, take a core and extract the, the little air bubbles that are trapped in that ice and then take measurements of the ancient atmosphere. That's going to be limited by what the ice, what ice is actually available. And so that's sort of one part of the answer. So you can also go to the oceans. Carbon dioxide is absorbed in the oceans. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that carbon is actually taken up into the shells of little, little critters. Um, their, their shells are made out of ca calcium carbonate. And so when they build their shells that, that they are actually reflecting or capturing a snapshot of what the carbon dioxide levels were like in the water. Um, and also, uh, that's also in, uh, influenced by temperature and temperature and carbon dioxide are also linked. So there's a lot of chemistry that goes into this, um, this, this problem. Um, but essentially when they die, those little critters, who have captured a, a tiny snapshot of what the atmosphere was like, their shells fall down onto the ocean floor. And over many millions of years, they become incorporated into the sedimentary rock record. And so you can actually drill down going back millions and millions of years to reconstruct uh, what, the, what the atmosphere would have looked like. So that's another way that you can do this, but those rocks aren't always available. First of all, uh, they're down at the bottom of the ocean. And so you have to drill them and, and get them out. And that's challenging. Secondly, um, the earth is constantly recycling crust. The, the tectonic movement of continents, we have new land that's being built, right? If you look at say the Hawaiian islands, that's relatively young land compared to, you know, where I am here in, in Maine in the Northeastern US. Um, and so in order to create new rock, other rock is constantly being recycled. So finding ancient enough rocks is a challenge. You can push that back even further by looking at the fossils of ancient plants. Um, so plants have small openings on them called stomata, and those openings allow the plant to take in carbon dioxide and to release oxygen. Um, and that's how plants, uh, they, they do photosynthesis, right? By taking in CO2 and then they release oxygen as a byproduct, the opposite of, of us as animals. Um, the size and the number of those little openings has a mathematical relationship to how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere. 
And if that plant has a close enough modern relative, or it's a really ancient plant like uh, ginkgo, for example, ginkgos are kind of a living fossil. They've been around for a really long time. Um, we can look at fossil leaves of ginkgo and we can look at modern leaves of ginkgo. We can, we can actually make a good predictive model. So if we have a certain number or size of stomata, that corresponds to certain concentrations of carbon dioxide. So fossils can help us to you know, extend or push back that um, or fill in gaps in our understanding of atmospheric CO2 levels over time. But all of this is not tricky. Um, it takes a lot of work, big teams of researchers. So um, there's uh, really only so much that we can do to really push back that history of our knowledge of CO2. And some of that is just limited by you know, what rocks are left around and do they contain the right fossils? Do those fossil plants have modern relatives that where we can establish that, that model? Um, yeah. So it's, it's kind of like, what did earth leave us to work with? And we're doing our best. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that, that, um, gives me a perfect cue for, for stepping into the main, um, kind of conceptual topic that I would like to, to, uh, poke your mind with. And it's about change. Mm. Um, one of the most important things I, I, from all the research that I've been doing and reading about sustainability, uh, not being you know, an, an expert in biology or physics or chemistry, what stays to me very clear is that change is a constant. Mm -hmm. um, and we humans, I hopefully will be talking to, to uh, sociologists and philosophers, and we will be talking about why, you no, know, but humans are not really keen to change we, we always tend to stability and to to stay for for very good reasons we will we will discuss that in another in other episodes but from 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 your perspective change and understanding what you were saying about for example recycling rocks I don't think people you know regular people non-expert people like me I've never imagined recycling rocks in the crust of the of the uh, uh, of the earth how how change is being driven in in you know these geological terms and these millions of years oh that is such a good question and from an existential standpoint you know the last thing we want to hear is that the the literal ground beneath our feet is not solid right but we are we are floating on on a mantle of, of liquid hot uh magma right deep below the yeah. earth um the core of the earth is not solid thank goodness because that actually is part of why we have life on earth that's a, that's another story but the fact that we have the, the, that the continents are moving that we have a dynamic earth um compared to a planet like you know mars or you know a, a, or, or others um that actually helps to drive some of the changes that actually propel the evolution of life forward. So for example, you know, we know that the position of the continents has changed through time. It's been relatively stable for about 60 million years. So pretty, pretty, I guess like th that's either young or old, um, depending on how you look at it. Um, but uh, there are changes, for example, North and South America, were not connected until just a few million years ago. And then they exchanged species in both directions. They'd been separated for pretty much their entire existence up until relatively recently. There used to be a, a, mm -hmm. an ocean seaway that went between them. Um, the Himalayas, right? The, the uplift of the, of the tallest mountains yes. on the earth, that was relatively recent. That only happened you know, several million years ago. Um, and both of those events have profoundly changed Earth's climate. They they changed how heat moves around in the oceans and in the atmosphere. Um, the the uplift of mountains changes rainfall patterns. You know, it's not an accident that in the Rockies, you know, to the west of the Rockies yes. in the U.S., it's it's very moist and wet. To the east of the Rockies, it's dry, right? So there's this rain rain shadow effect that um, that happens because of mountain up upbuilding, and how that changes how moisture moves around in the atmosphere. So all I'm just giving you a couple of little examples, but the, the physical makeup of the earth, where the continents are, how connected are they? All of these things has changed through time. And those events have had profound implications for the trajectory that evolution has taken. And then of course you have things that happen out in space that then have huge impacts on earth, literally impacts. I'm talking yes. about, you know, the asteroid that slammed into earth 65 million years ago. And without that, we would probably be having this conversation as two dinosaurs, right? We'd be the civilization of dinosaurs um, talking on a podcast, right? The age of mammals would not have been possible yeah. if we had had uh, these really large um, uh, 
predators running around still. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the the uh, the idea of, of successful species and surviving all these changes um, is is also something that um, amazed me. Um, you know, every child I have a couple of young children of my own, and and the the classic is dinosaurs when they're young. So mm -hmm. I had to learn a lot about them. Um, dinosaurs live for 200, uh, uh, 200 million years. Uh, humans we've been around uh, more or less around uh, 200,000. So it's a tenth of that, or mm -hmm. not even that. It's, I got it wrong. My maths are really wrong. But anyway, the point is that it's just a, a blink in terms of geological scales. Okay, it was clear that mathematics is not my strength but even worse when I'm thinking in a different language, which is not my first language. Um, so dinosaurs live for 200 million years, humans for around 200,000 years. So that's one thousandth. So humans have been around for one thousandth of the time that dinosaurs live. Sorry for that. The dependence between these organisms and their environment, um, how, what, what are the types of, of, of things that you, well, and paleocologists in overall that the, the, the Gil has discovered or has learned, um, how, how these interactions, how, how these relations have been, you know, evolved uh, uh, along uh, these geological times? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so as I mentioned, you have the physical makeup of the earth, which is changing, creating connections, creating barriers. So um, it, that affects where species can move. Um, I often talk about species ranges migrating. We think of migration as being something that happens on a seasonal time scale, like a Canada goose going from the Arctic further south for the winter. But on these long time scales, the, the, the entire range of a species can migrate as the climate changes or the habitat shifts. And so when you have something like the Bering Land Bridge that connected Eurasia to North America, there were exchanges of species that went in both directions. So here in the United States, we think of the bison as being kind of an icon of, of our country. And meanwhile, the horse was something that was introduced by the Spaniards when they came and explored North America. But if you know your fossils, bison only arrived here from Eurasia about 200,000 years ago. And again, I know that sounds like a really long time for some people, but ecologically speaking, geologically speaking, that's actually really recent. Yeah. And meanwhile, horses actually evolved in North America. They've been here for tens of millions of years. They co-evolved with the plant communities and the other animals that were here. They migrated across the land bridge west into Eurasia, went extinct here, and then we're actually reintroduced by people just a few hundred years ago. Yeah. And so this whole concept of, you know, what's native um, or, or, you know, all of that becomes challenged when we start to look at the long-term history. And it's important to remember that these species, they weren't just moving just because some of them were moving because of these new connections like land bridges, but a lot of them were actually responding to the changing climates of the time. So uh, we've had these regular cycles of ice ages and warm periods. We live in a warm period right now, but our current warm period is just one of dozens of warm periods that have happened with these sort of seesaws back and forth, cold, warm, cold, warm. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes back about two and a half million years ago. And um, these ice age climate cycles have have clues to offer us about how species and their interactions are changing as the environment changes. Um, do, what you know? Why do we see some species survive while others go extinct? Um, you know, does it matter if you have a more flexible, broad, generalist diet, or if you're more specialist? Um, how do smaller-bodied animals survive when the larger-bodied animals go extinct? Why mm -hmm. did the largest animals go extinct? All of these things are, are rele relevant questions to helping us to understand the, the climate change and the responses and the biodiversity that are coming or that are happening right now. Um, and so, you know, people often say, you know, the climate has never changed this quickly um, in Earth's history. And that's actually not true. We have seen some events during the last even 20,000 years where the rate of climate change has been, and, and the magnitude, so how fast and how much, has actually been comparable to some of these abrupt events that we can pick up in an ice core in the past. However, our starting point 
is different, right? We're, we went from, you know, 13,000 years ago, we went from cold to warm very quickly. Now we're going from warm to hot just as quickly. So there's a limit to these analogs, but we can still use them. Uh, you know, we're not going into the future complete with, you know, blindfolds on. We actually do have some clues that can help us understand how both biodiversity, but also human societies can survive this, you know, this coming climate crisis. It's, it's like the the earth is literally providing a, a, a blueprint, a roadmap for us, um, for how to help societies and ecosystems be more resilient and also a warning for how our actions might be undermining that resilience. Yeah. I, I remember uh, looking at one of these charts of CO2 emissions, uh, well, no emissions, sorry, concentrations in the atmosphere. Um, it, it, it really called my attention, uh, as I was mentioning before, uh, around 500 million years ago, there were around 4,000 parts per million in the atmosphere. That's what yeah. I saw. And then there is a huge drop um, uh, around 350 million years ago that lasted almost 100 million years. Uh, a huge drop, in, obviously, in relation to 4,000. It dropped to 500. Um, and then um, after that, there, there is being uh, an up and down, up and down constant, constantly in the last 800,000 years between 280 and 180 parts per million. So I guess the first, the first question is, do we know why that drop happens um, in, in that specific, uh, uh, what, what, what was it? So the, the easiest way to get carbon out of the atmosphere on, on, the, on a geologic time scale is to build mountains because it, it's a little complicated, but when you, when you have an increase in tectonic activity, because the, the, the motion of, or the activity of earth's tectonic plates has not been stable through time. You know, the, if you imagine this giant fiery furnace that sometimes is more active and sometimes is less active, um, when it's more active and you get more, uh, movement of those plates, they collide together. They, they often will push up and, and, and create mountains. That's how we get these mountain chains that we have, um, the, the, when you build a new mountain, and again, this takes place over hundreds of thousands to millions of years. So this is a slow process. It's not something we can rely on, you know, to get us through the next few centuries of, of climate yeah. uh, mitigation. We will get there. We will get yeah. There. Yeah. Someday. Right. Um, but what happens is when you build mountains, you get a bunch of brand new rock and that brand new rock is able to weather it erodes. And essentially what happens is carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, dissolves into rainwater and it actually creates a, a kind of an acid, not something that would burn us if we felt it on our skin, but it's enough to slowly start eroding the rock, creates a chemical reaction. And that rock, as it erodes and turns into sand and, and finer grained dust, it actually gets washed out into the oceans and ends up being deposited at the bottom of the sea. So there's this very long process of CO2 in the atmosphere has a reaction with rainwater, which has a reaction with rocks. Mm -hmm. And then that all gets washed out to the ocean and then buried. So it's sort of, it's like earth was the original uh, geoengineer, right? Carbon capture is, is a thing in the geologic record. It just takes a really long time. Mm -hmm. And then how does it get released again? Largely through volcanic activity. So mm -hmm. it's sort of belching out some CO2 and then slowly taking it back and burying it at the bottom of the ocean. And then that crust might get recycled and then the whole process starts again, but it's not linear. It's not at a constant rate. And so there are periods where you have more activity and less activity. And some of those periods of high CO2 release correspond with mass extinctions. So the most intense extinctions that we've seen on this planet, you know, um, like the end Permian, where we see almost the loss of all life, um, you know, that all life was still in the oceans and that high, those high levels of CO2 create ocean acidification, right? They, um, they make, they make the ocean less hospitable to marine life. And that has triggered some of our biggest extinctions that we've seen on the planet. So, there are some species that have survived, um, but then in other cases, we lose certain organisms like trilobites. We don't have those anymore, right? Ammonites, we don't have those anymore. So these processes of, um, of uh, sort of these ge geologic processes correspond to big pulses in biodiversity and extinction. And that's been going on as long as we've had life on earth. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's, it's um, 
it's a humbling thing to understand that our position as as species, even if if we want to call ourselves dominant species, whatever whatever that may mean, um, is not given. No, it's it's something that we cannot uh, ensure that is going to continue there, and that's. That's a little bit the purpose of me doing these uh, uh, interviews and a little bit of the work that I will have to do at the end. Hopefully I will try to re-engage with some of my, my hosts and uh, my guests and, and, and try to explore what, what does it really mean for us as a species? But we, I, I will get to a bit more, more philosophical questions later on. I will, get, I will try to go back uh, now to uh, these, these um, ups and downs in our concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, so I was saying in the last 800,000 years, there were these up and downs jumping uh, uh, continuously. That, that change uh, is always driven by the same uh, factors or there are different factors that drive these up and downs. Mm. So the, the, the dominant controls, the, if you imagine that the earth has a series of control buttons and knobs that you can turn up and down, if you want to create ice ages or you want to turn up the climate, um, you know, if you imagine that this is like a great video game and you're, you're in control, you're in, you're in the driver's seat. Um, the, what controls those changes in climate is actually different depending on the time scale we're talking about. So with these really big scales, these tectonic scales over millions of, of years or hundreds of millions of years, things like mountain building and erosion, that's the control. But if you zoom in on the last 800,000 years, um, it's actually something different. It's how close we are to the sun, how much of the sun's incoming energy we get over time. Mm -hmm. And so those events that I mentioned before, the uplift of the Himalayas and the connection between North and South America as the Isthmus of Panama, you know, emerged yeah. from the sea, right? Um, those actually helped cool the planet enough that suddenly we see the emergence of these what we call orbital scale forcings on the climate system because they relate to earth's tilt and orbit so um you know our our axis is tilted uh about 23 degrees but mm -hmm. that actually shifts a little bit through time so we might be pointed in, here in the northern hemisphere we might be pointed towards the sun a little more or a little less over time, um, how elliptical or how how shaped like an oval our orbit is also changes. changes through time. Yeah, mm -hmm. so sometimes we're a little more circular, sometimes we're a little more uh, like an oval. And then within that, we Earth also kind of wobbles like a tilt as it goes in its revolutions around the sun. And all those three factors actually change in really predictable ways. The first person to discover this phenomenon um, uh, Milan was a guy named Milankovitch, and he was actually uh, calculating these, these cycles by hand in the first, during the First World War when he was essentially um, uh, kept, kept prisoner. Um, he was on house arrest. Um, and uh, he was trying to understand this puzzle of why we have ice ages. And they found evidence of past glaciations uh, in Europe and in other parts of the world, just looking at the rock saying, okay, this all looks like places where glaciers have been. What would cause the ice to grow and, and expand so much further south than we would see it now coming out of you know, the, the Alps into the valleys, things like that. Because we see evidence of glaciers, mm -hmm. but we don't know what caused it. Um, and so, so he actually had this idea to try to see um, if the sun was essentially the cause. It's not so much the sun, it's how close we are. Yeah. Um, but this regularity explains why we have this, it's, it's almost like a, uh, you imagine like a little um, a ball on uh, a string sort of swinging pendulum. back and forth, right? Yes. A pendulum, thanks, that's yes. the word I'm looking for. <laughs> um, but yeah, so... Um, so you can actually predict with pretty good accuracy. Um, and he did it all by hand. And later when people took the first ice cores in the eighties and nineties, they were able to line up exactly um, with the, the calculations that he made, those predictions that he made of these, they call them the Milankovitch cycles now. Um, and so essentially, you know, you, for at least the last million years or so, the dominant control on earth's climate system has been our changes, subtle, very subtle, tiny changes in our, our orbit um, and how we relate to the sun, how much incoming solar energy you have. When that, when that amount goes down a little bit, you start to get glaciers growing in the Northern hemisphere. And then uh, when that increases and we get more of the sun's incoming energy, those glaciers start to melt. And there's lots of feedback loops and the other mechanisms that come into play. Um, the earth is a very complicated system. It's not just a thermostat that turns on and off, mm -hmm. but that's kind of the dominant force at this time scale. So we're currently in 
an interglacial, a warm period. And the warm periods on average last about 10 to 12,000 years. The cold part of that cycle lasts about 100,000 years, right? So we're actually in glacial conditions more often than warm conditions if you look at the last million years or so. Um, so that's important because now humans, people, have actually taken over as the dominant control on our climate system more than these large scale tectonic shifts, more than uh, our, our position relative to the sun, right? That's, I mean, that's very humbling as like, an, to think about like, a, we're an organism yes. and we have taken over the earth's climate system. Yeah. Uh, that's actually only happened once in geologic history, right? With the, the, in terms of just having one single organism that was so had such a profound impact on the earth system that it changed things for everything else. And which was it? So uh, it was actually an algae, <laughs> a okay. tiny, yeah, a tiny little, uh, tiny little photosynthetic single celled organism that formed, it's still around actually, you can go um, and find them, they create these mats that that form into these kind of big pedestals known as stromatolites. And yeah. you can find fossil stromatolites, um, but there are also still stromatolites now, these stromatolite forming algae are still around. Dr. Gill and I thought that it was important to elaborate a bit more about these algae she is referring to. These algae are known as blue-green algae, also called cyanobacteria. And this is because the prokaryotic nature of the blue-green algae has caused them to be classified with bacteria in the prokaryote kingdom Monera. And the thing that the algae did is a bit different. Um, they actually produced oxygen as a waste product, like all yep. photosynthetic organisms do. But at that time, we didn't have an oxygen rich atmosphere. And so uh, there's evidence that this initial release of oxygen actually profoundly changed the earth system, um, causing an oxygenation crisis for all those organisms that had not adapted to, uh, to having oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, and so that actually was one of the sort of big shakeups of the earth system that is all just because of this little algae. But thanks to that change, so it was very challenging at the time, um, there's, there's evidence of extinction that happened in association with that. Um, but we have an oxygen-rich atmosphere and we have the formation of an ozone layer, which it turns out is really important if you want to get life on land, because without an ozone layer, yes you have harmful UV radiation and okay. that's really bad <laughs> if you have DNA. So, um, so it's one of those cases where this, this, this big shakeup actually had, you know, is one of the things that contributed to the fact that we have humanity on the planet now. Yes. Right. And I, and I just want to take a moment here if I can, sure. because, you know, I basically said, yeah, there's a silver lining to, you know, basically being an organism that created this toxic byproduct oxygen, which, you know, potentially killed off lots of other species. And, you know, because we have life, you know, on earth today, that that's based on oxygen or this asteroid that killed the dinosaurs ushered in the, the age of mammals. And that actually worked out really well for us. When I say that you might take that to the next step and say, you know, is she actually arguing that what we're doing to the planet now is, is good because it's going to be beneficial for some organisms. And I, I think, I think that would be stretching things too far. So oftentimes when I talk about the big upheavals that happen in the fossil record, people say, well, are you just arguing that what we're doing now is okay? Because we could, you know, earth survives and we've had these big changes in the past. And the, the answer to that is no. Um, what I'm saying is that earth is very special and part of what makes earth special are some pretty random, often catastrophic events that we hope not to repeat going forward. Mm -hmm. But it means that finding a replacement planet or making a replacement planet, like just jumping on a rocket to Mars and starting over again, that is not an option. That's not creating a habitable planet is not trivial. It's not easy. And we have billions of years of geoengineering to thank for our habitable planet right now. So what that tells me is that we need to do a better job of taking care of it. So that's part of it. And then the other part is, you know, okay, well, at least we have this blueprint of how, how to get through a catastrophe, right? Like what was it about, uh, you know, being a, a bison that allowed you to get through 
the climate changes yeah. that we saw at the last deglaciation where mammoths didn't make it, right? So, so that's where that's to me where the fossil record can be hugely informative in these big existential questions. Of course. Thanks for letting yeah. me go on that rant. <laughs> no, it's, it's fascinating. Please, uh, the more you have of those, that's that's great um, because that's exactly one of the big questions. You no, know, is uh, for, for for scientists, and you know, you you look at data, um, you um, check what the the data is telling you, and you come to the most logical conclusion. Um, but then logic um, gets into the the area of ethics and moral and philosophy, if you want. And then we we start saying, okay, from from a very practical pragmatical way, looking at the information we have. This is what could happen, and we see uh, humans. I mean, we could we could see humans just as another species that, yeah, we may disappear for whatever reason, but life will go on. That's yeah. the most probable thing that will happen. Looking at what happened before, now the key question here is: Are we? It's complicated because we are conscious of our existence. And the point here is, are we going to let that happen? Mm. Uh, especially knowing that is is on our own hand. You no, know, this possible demise of of uh, of our species species is not is not made by, you know, uh, um, a meteor or and a, a huge rock coming from space. Uh, uh, it's you know, from our, our own making. So it's yeah. up to us to decide. You no, know? that's that's a, a super important thing. But. Yeah, because we're not we're not the dinosaurs. We're the dinosaurs and the meteor. Yes, <laughs> right. Yes. We're both. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So, just one quick quick question before we move on to the next uh, next bit. Um, in in uh, what what you were mentioning before about the 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 the, the knobs uh, uh, for uh, gra graduating these the, uh, CO two levels. Um, what do plants have? I mean, you mentioned already this, this algae, but, uh, you know, again, from my very basic uh, education on biology, uh, one of the reasons that um, I was, at, at least I remember, that life moved from the oceans to the land was because there was a very rich, carbon-rich atmosphere, and plants found, like, the perfect space to grow because that they that's what they mostly need carbon and light of uh, light of the sun um so if i'm mistaken please tell me where plants and taking over the land are one of the factors to reduce the co2 levels and increase the oxygen in in our atmosphere that then you know precipitated a bunch of other things but at some point that was enough is, is still enough so so is your question, will the plant, will the traits that have allowed plants to be so successful and persistent through these changes, will that help them in the future? Uh, well, the, the first part of the question is, it's actually true that that happened. I mean, mm -hmm. it is, a, a it was a factor and then yes, it could happen again. And, and then maybe we can even go further with the question. Can we humans manipulate that knob in order to, mm. to especially knowing how long these things take in geological terms? Right. So, so I think there's, there's a couple of things there. One is that plants themselves have actually been really resilient to, to climate change um, with a couple of notable exceptions. Um, for example, trees in Europe um, have slowly been uh, losing diversity. Um, every time we have a glacial cycle, the trees, the glaciers come out of the north, the trees track their climate south, and they run up against that Mediterranean climate. Um, it's actually not the mountains, it's the physical climate where you have this winter, wet, summer, dry climate in Europe around the Mediterranean um, that a lot of trees that are adapted to the more continental climates, they just can't, they can't uh, adapt to that fast enough. Um, and so Europe has been losing trees successively during every uh, glacial interglacial transition. And they've actually been losing the trees that are more warm adapted. <laughs> so those are the ones okay. that you would want going into the next century. Right. But for the most part, plants globally through history have actually been remarkably resilient compared to animals when it comes to climate change. And some of that has to do with the fact that they make their own food, right? They just need sunshine. Um, they also have really, um, you know, Im imagine being able to completely separate generations as a species. So you can have a seed that can sit in the soil for hundreds of years 
imagine if you were just able to just, you know, drop a baby <laughs> and then several hundred years later, when, when times are, are better, that baby grows up uh, with no investment from its parents whatsoever and just walks off. Right. I mean, that that's sort of similar to what plants are able to do. They're really actually yes. incredibly remarkable. They can clone themselves, right. They can just, you know, sprout up a, a new individual. Um, imagine if I just hacked off my hand and it grew another version of me. Right. I mean, those are all really great adaptations, um, but they're really unique to plants. And so, you know, the things that we can do to, you know, so plants are, are actually at a, at a bit of an advantage for the most part going into the future. Uh, however, there are things that we're doing that are undermining that resilience, like introducing diseases and pests and pathogens um, around the planet. As we, as we, as we move as, as people, we move things with us, whether those are pest, you know, disease pests or um, new plants that are out competing the existing plants, things like that. So these non, these introduced species are, are undermining the resilience of, of plants to climate change. Um, also having a, a fragmented landscape, right? Plants are able to track their climates, even though they, they can't actually move. They're just throwing their genes across the landscape and these little escape pods that we call seeds. Um, but that can only happen if the seed lands in a place that's actually habitable. And we've paved over a lot of that in many places. And so there's, there's a limit to kind of how, how much we can expect plants innate responses to get us through this in the future. And then people have also turned to plants when it comes to climate mitigation, right? So this, this plant trees concept that, that people kind of lean on. Um, and there are real limits to that. Um, we, first of all, the answer is not to plant trees everywhere. Grasslands are really important and unique and should stay grasslands and are actually, you actually become carbon sinks when you try to do things like disturb them and plant trees. Um, you know, maintaining healthy forests and, and native vegetation in the places that, you, you know, that you are is actually much better than just running out and planting a million trees. Um, and so, and it's also a slow process, right? Uh, trees and, and other plants do take carbon out of the atmosphere. They fix it in their tissues, but when they die, they just release that right back into the atmosphere. So, and it takes a really long time to grow a tree. Um, yeah. So there's kind of a limit to these, these magic bullet kinds of responses that people have suggested as, yeah. as a way around the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. Did I answer the question you wanted me to answer? Uh, yeah. So I, I probably I look. I'm I'm always thinking in, in the audience. Um, yeah. What I'm what I'm trying to get, if, if I know is is complex. You no, know, there are many many factors involved. But um, what I want to know is is in a, you know a simplest way is is again uh, more or less what you already said. You no, know, can we just plant more trees and mm. and, and and get you know a, a a good result or a, or ease our problems with CO two emissions? And before you answer that, I, it's related to what you were saying. I when I was when I was younger, way younger. If you allow me, then I'm still young. Um, I I participated in a in a in a in a campaign in in my home country in Mexico to reforest one part mm. of a forest down south in the south of Mexico City where I grew up, that is very very close to me, very dear to me. And and I remember going in trucks with the army. You know, the army put trucks, and people were hundreds of people, volunteers. It was really nice experience in terms of community grabbing your, your couple of little pine trees and going up and, 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 and going up the mountain for a few hundred meters and then dig a hole, whatever you can, and just without instructions, without really knowing, mm, yeah. just put your tree there, cover it up and, and, and hope that everything went fine. But I remember when I was walking down, I still remember that this was more than 20 years ago. Um, when I was walking down, I remember seeing all the crushed little plants that mm. all the people going up the mountain crush for planting trees and I was thinking is this is this okay I mean yeah we crush probably more plants going up I don't know what type of plants there were but yep. we crush more plants on the way up to plant one tree that that actually the plant the number of trees planted so I know it's super complex but again the, the question was can we deal with CO2 um, um, in our atmosphere just by planting more trees mm -hmm. I think the answer the short answer is uh, not really. Uh, when you look at these kinds of um, proposals on the ground, 
they often involve very well-meaning and very heartfelt campaigns that are often doomed to failure because oftentimes people are going out and they're planting the wrong tree, right? Or maybe they're planting a tree that's not going to, that's not going to survive in that place because of the rainfall patterns or the temperature, especially if those things are changing due to climate change. Or they think, okay, well, we have these these uh, like the cornfields of the U.S. in the Midwest, um, you know, if we can restore those or take them back and plant trees, well, that's not the ecosystem that's supposed to be there. It's actually a grassland, um, and disturbing that grassland may be worse than trying to restore it to whatever the natural vegetation would have been. Um, and so, a lot of these kinds of efforts are well-meaning, but they are misplaced, and I think they relate to this need for for people to make a difference and to look for easy quick solutions but your your best bet is honestly to support whatever local um restoration projects are actually already happening um to look at uh you know what what indigenous land management is like in the place that you that you are um you know, what have people been doing? Uh, and that's not going to be true everywhere. Um, but, you know, in large parts of the world, there are indigenous communities that have been stewarding and managing the land through many challenging transitions going back thousands of years or more. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah so listen to them, right? What, yeah. what works um, uh, in some places, you know, that's going to involve allowing some fire or doing controlled burns versus fire suppression, which can actually have devastating consequences as we've seen in the Western US. So I think the yeah. short answer is probably not in most places. And if you're going to do it, you should be doing it in the places where we know it, it where, where you're where, as a part of a, a restoration goal, not just as a carbon capture goal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, great. great. But any yeah. of these magic bullet solutions, sorry to, no. to harp on this, you know, there's really no, there's no way out of this other than decarbonization, right? Yeah. Just saying, oh, we'll just take the carbon out of the atmosphere and, and make little cubes and bury the cubes at the bottom of the ocean or whatever, like all of these different efforts um, or, or uh, solar geoengineering, right? Releasing uh, sulfur compounds in the atmosphere um, to essentially cool the planet that way. I mean, the people who suggest these things are often people who have a, an understanding of how the physics of the earth works, but there are ecological knock-on effects of those kinds yeah. of activities. Like all of those things are, yeah. it's like, it's so much more potential for disaster and it's yes. so much more complicated. Like what we could just, I mean, hear me out. We could just not emit as many fossil fuels. And yet yes. we, we're bending over backwards to think of anything else other than doing just that. Yes. And there are really interesting answers for why on that, but before yeah. maybe we can get into that. Um, let's let's move on to the next part uh, of these mm -hmm. conceptual topics. The uh, the next one is long term thinking, and mm -hmm. that's precisely where I wanted to talk about these really crazy ideas. Sorry for the crazy, but I think it's just lunatic of geoengineering. Um, so the long term thinking, I know, I know, in in terms of geological scales, you have to think in long terms. Yes. How how do we manage with our immediacy, especially nowadays with our economy and, and life of consumption and that every time goes faster and fa faster? Have you found a way when you communicate to people or you're trying to communicate uh, with your uh, audience as well in your podcast? Um, how how does long term thinking? How do we should really take into account this long term thinking idea? Um, I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the crux, right? It's it's the short term thinking that got us here in the first place. It's thinking only to the next election cycle, or thinking only to the next, you know, um, investment report. You know, think, thinking in terms of, you know, how how can I be more wealthy by the end of this year than I was last year? Um, or even thinking about your own lifespan. How you know what can I do to um, to benefit, right? Let alone my children, my grandchildren, my great, great grandchildren. And that kind of thinking is, is very, um, very Western, right? It's, um, it's very capitalist, you know, there, we could, we could talk about all the reasons why we think that way, but I think part of it is also that we, you know, we just don't know our history very well. We don't, we're very disconnected from even the recent past and how, 
you know, we, we keep making the same mistakes as a, as a society or as a civilization. And I'm, I'm, I'm an American, I live in the United States. And so of course my, my biases are going to be towards, you know, my own culture and upbringing. Um, but it just, it, it just, even with something like the global pandemic, where I, I love history, um, because maybe because I'm just drawn to this, these, the, the past, at, because of the lessons that are embedded in the past for, for how we can get through the challenges of today. But, you know, I, I've read a lot about, um, the 1918 flu pandemic and just how we learned so many things from that pandemic that we sud- suddenly somehow forgot when it came yes. to the current pandemic. And it just, it kills me to, to see how we approach every single new challenge that comes as though it's never, ever happened before. It's completely novel. How did we get here? We have no idea, right? But if you don't know your past, if you don't know your history, then you have no idea how you arrived at this point. You have no idea, you know, how to roadmap your way out of the problems that we're facing. And I just don't, I don't, I don't know if I was drawn to paleoecology and deep time thinking because of, um, you know, because to me, I see that there are solutions to understanding where we are, or Mm -hmm. if, if it was the other way around, right. Do I turn to the past to solve these problems or was I drawn to the past because of the problems that are here? Um, that, that was kind of a messy way of saying this, but I, I remember actually, I know the answer because if I think about how I became a paleoecologist, um, I wanted to know, I grew up in the nineties. I, uh, you know, when, when we had, we were, we were learning about deforestation in the Amazon and the ozone layer and all of these challenges, climate change was not on the forefront. It was deforestation and it was pollution. Um, and I remember thinking like, why are we doing this to ourselves? Why are we poisoning our planet? And I was actually first drawn to studying this from a human perspective to try to understand the relationships between people and nature. And if I could un- unlock that, maybe I would understand you know, where it all broke down. How did we go from living in, in, a, in, a, in some kind of harmony with the natural world, living in a, in a world that, or having societies where we were deeply connected to natural cycles, to resources, to understanding our role and, and not, not taking too much, not poisoning our own homes, right? I, I wanted to understand where that break point happened. And I first came at it from the lens of history, from the lens of anthropology, and just kind of going back in time. And I found myself just going back further and further in time, thinking, you know, when did this breakdown happen? And the further back in time I got, the more I understood that there have been these dynamic changes in the earth. And that really is where I became fascinated with these sort of deeper histories. And so I sort of left people behind in a way and started thinking more about how the natural world has changed. Although we still do in our lab, we still do work on, you know, the relationships between people and nature and how those change through time. But but for me, I think a lot of it just comes to, came from a place of wanting to understand, like, where did we go wrong? How can we how can we fix this, this, Mm -hmm. this very dysfunctional relationship that we have. And I think part of it, you know, whether you can, you can pinpoint a specific moment in the history of humanity, you know, we can, that's a whole other conversation, but, but we should at least be looking, right. We should at least be reading about the past. We should at least be listening to elders. We should be learning from what's happened before, because otherwise, how could you ever know how we got here and, and how to, how to, how to move forward. It just, to yes. me, it's so obvious. I don't know, but I guess other I don't know. people I, don't. Yeah. I, I, I completely agree. My, my, it's my, my feeling as well. I, I, I share the feeling. Um, there are, there are some, some interesting theories that I've been, I've been reading and I share, um, I believe, you no, know, uh, for example, agricultural revolution was a key mm. moment. So I don't think there was one, there were, there has been several ones. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the Industrial Revolution was another one, and and then in, in the history of mankind, we can we can surely find several of these points. Um, but going going back, if you don't mind, to to mm-hmm. thinking about this long term thinking, but towards the future, um, the 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 quick fix solutions. Um, the geoengineering for me is is one of the most uh, uh, dangerous ones. If, mm. if you don't mind, if you could tell us what you know about uh, what what ideas are circling around and what what uh, people in in your field in biology and climatology is that what what are they saying about these things? 
Yeah, so so there's a few different approaches um, to to geoengineering, and and some of there's there's different scales and different uh, tools that are all underneath this umbrella. And one of them is carbon capture. So this technology of, you know, can we fertilize the oceans to increase productivity of uh, of, of marine algae? So adding iron to the oceans, um, uh, maybe that would um, allow marine algae to increase their uptake of, of, of CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, or maybe we can just literally build machines that will suck up carbon and create, like I said, boxes or blocks of, of that are made out of carbon and that we could just stack them up or, or drop them in the bottom of the sea or something like that. Um, and so there's efforts, geoengineering efforts to change the composition of the atmosphere itself. So taking CO2, drawing a drawdown effort. Um, and depending on which angle you take, um, you know, that can either be, there, there's, there's so much we don't understand, right? And so first of all, just actually sequestering carbon, taking it and, and taking it out of the atmosphere and, and, and binding it up in some way, that technology doesn't exist. It's still science fiction at this point. And so it's not a, it's not a practical solution now. It may be at some point, but it's not now. Um, and, uh, and of course, as soon as you stop, right, then this is the, one of the big arguments. As soon as you stop some of these activities, if you're still emitting CO2 while all of this is happening, then you're just going to have a really abrupt shift back to the same place that we've been, or maybe worse. Um, if you try to do something where you're manipulating the physical earth system, like uh, uh, adding iron as a fertilizer to the oceans, that's going to have lots of knock-on effects to ocean food webs that we may or may not understand. Um, what does it mean to fertilize algae um, in an ocean that has been devastated by overfishing and harvesting. So the top of those food webs has already been impacted. Everything is connected. You can't look at any one component in isolation. So that's sort of one, one level. The other level is uh, the solar geoengineering that I mentioned, where um, rather than focusing on carbon, you just, you essentially create air pollution that is designed, and I'm using that term very deliberately, that is designed to reflect more of the sun's energy back into space. Um, and so you're literally cooling the planet by essentially, essentially you're literally cooling the planet by shading it out. Mm -hmm. And the kinds of materials people have talked about, um, like sulfur dioxides, those actually have you know, those have impacts on species. Biodiversity, um, you know, may have negative responses to the kinds of materials that you put up in the atmosphere, right? If you, if you look at acid rain, for example, some of the same chemicals that people have proposed that we put into the atmosphere are the same ones that have caused um, uh, uh, acid rain, which has negatively impacted trees and other wildlife, right? And so, and, and, and then, so that's just from the biodiversity perspective, um, it turns out where pollution or, or emissions happen is really important. So even though the global system is connected and, and you know, CO2 moves and is mixed all throughout the atmosphere, where the pollution is coming from, climate modelers have worked on this, it actually has big implications for what the knock-on effects are. Um, and so depending on where you do the solar geoengineering, um, doing it at all, there are some models that suggest that that could actually create things like droughts by changing rainfall patterns, right? So shading out the planet, depending, depending on where you do it and how it all plays out, could have geopolitical considerations. And, and yes. how do you make sure all the, all the countries are, are equally buying in? What if, um, what if Mexico decides they're going to do it, but the U.S. doesn't agree or vice versa, right? And you imagine these power dynamics that are at play. Yeah. Um, and so thinking, you know, thinking about these global scale projects where different countries may pay the price um, and, and probably the most vulnerable ones are the likeliest to pay the biggest price, you know, those kinds of impacts cannot be overstated. And so and then again, if you stop, so let's say, okay, we're just not going to, you know, we have, we have these un, unforeseen consequences of solar geoengineering. So we're just going to stop pumping sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, 
and pretty much because, you know, people have said, well, we can just stop at any moment and it, and, and, you know, it doesn't have a long residence time. It'll go away. And, and so if it's causing a problem, we should be able to fix it. But then that means that you just, you're right back where you started in terms of warming the planet. So, you know, none of these things are practical. I mean, right now, a lot of them don't even exist. Um, It's still science fiction, but you can't ignore the, the importance of just not emitting the fossil fuels in the first place. That is the biggest, quickest, safest thing that we can do Yes. Um, rather than trying to do all these things that, you know, in a deeply interconnected earth system, we don't really understand very well. Yeah. I love, I love when you said that everything, everything is interconnected and everything, every, everything in this planet is interdependent as well. Um, and I, I, I guess one, one possible analogy we could make, I, I mean, I'll make, and then you, you tell me if I'm wrong uh, or it doesn't work, my analogy. Um, I, was, I was reading uh, a few years ago, again, on my, on my dis- voyages of discovery through the texts of biology um, on uh, a series of, of uh, species introduced, especially in Australia, that is a very particular sp- uh, place because of the isolation that it has with the continent. Um, so the British, when when uh, they they um, colonized there, they they wanted to do you know their their uh, sports and things. And I remember one example where they decided to introduce um, uh, foxes, and mm. they messed up completely the uh, uh, the ecosystem because there was no predator for foxes. And a similar case happened with a, a specific type of frog. I think they introduced as well in uh, in Australia the cane toad. Yeah, has, totally. is, an, is a yeah. classic example. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And things went really bad because mm-hmm. you'd never know exactly what is going to happen. And that's what is called, you know, in, in the, in the, in the systems theory is the emergence No, is that yeah. you never know how things are going to interact and what is going to come out, come out out of that. So I think we can extrapolate those, ex- those samples that are part of our history now. And that we know very well that we did really wrong and multiply it by, I don't know, a huge number if we try to do something similar at the scale of the planet, the entire planet, it's just going to go really wrong, like yeah. sideways in ways that we cannot even predict. And we are going to end up having a much more complex and probably many more complex problems than the one we started with. Oh, definitely. I think those are great examples. And anytime we try to try to, to think we know better than nature, it hasn't worked out. Um, yeah. and, and in this, and the same thing is happening now where we've taken over as the, you know, we've hijacked the earth's climate system and it's not working out for us. Right. And so the, I think the, the solution to that is not to just lean in to that and do more of it, right. To try to manipulate things even more, but just to back off from what we were doing. That's causing these negative impacts. Yes. And that is, again, perfect cue for the last topic is about limits. Mm. Conceptually speaking, from your perspective, what are the most clear limits that we need to, you know, stay within and um, other, other, any other concepts or ideas that you may have within the idea of limits? Ooh, that is a really tough one. Um, and, and the reason for that is that, um, you know, there are tipping points. There are points of no return. Yes. Um, we, we don't know exactly where those might be, but we've seen them in, there are paleo analogs, right? Where we can say, okay, there are threshold responses, right? That not all things are linear where you just increase one thing and the other thing increases. Um, there are sort of moments where you increase something and nothing happens. And then you go past a threshold and then there's a flip, a switch in the, in the system. And so we do know that that's true. And it's probably going to be true for some things like ice sheet dynamics. Um, you know, if we reach a certain point, then glaciers are going to melt more rapid, more rapidly. Um, but overall, I, I think we emphasize this concept of limits in a, in, in, in ways that aren't necessarily helpful. Um, and what I mean by that is that, um, I, I think by emphasizing limits, we are unintentionally reinforcing binary thinking where everything is okay or not okay, Mm -hmm. right? We're, we're fine up until a point and then we're not fine and, and not fine is defined as like total civilizational collapse or, um, extinction of all life or, you know, the, the, they're very extreme. Um, and rather than 
binaries like that, I would actually argue for thinking about um, a continuum of, of harm, right? And so, you know, harm has already happened globally in terms of climate impacts. Um, the more we can do now to reduce our emissions, the more harm we can prevent. And harm prevention will always be worth it because there will always be, you know, so even if we blow past the 1.5 degrees target, which looks increasingly likely, even if we blow past two degrees, um, 2.5, three, right? I, I don't want to live in a four degrees warming world, but I would rather, I would rather live in a three degrees world or a two or a one or nothing. Right. But, um, you know, if we, if we move past 1.5, I talk to a lot of people every day who seem to think that that means that we just have to give up and just live with the new world as it is. And I find that that kind of thinking is really harmful. So I think talking about limits is important, but I think we haven't figured out how to do it as scientists and science communicators, policymakers in ways that haven't caused the public to fall into this trap of, oh, we're okay. And then if we go past a limit, then we're not okay. And by not okay, I mean like really not okay. Um, rather, instead, we should be kind of focusing on the more we do now, the the less harm we we pass on, right? The better the world will be for for future generations, for our for our kids, for ourselves, even because we live for a long time. And so, and the other the other reason I get a little bit a little bit iffy around limits is because people often talk about population as one of these limits, like what is the carrying capacity of the planet? And you can get down some really dark racist pathways really quickly. Um, because if you look like the places, the countries that are the biggest emitters have the lowest population growth rates or even negative population growth in some cases, yes. whereas the countries that, that uh, where you have the highest population growth rates, those have those countries have contributed the least to climate change in the past and now for the most part. And so that's, um, and yet some people still say, oh, it's population, it's population, and we need to be reducing population, we have to keep it, keep it under a certain threshold. Um, when in reality, it's, it's about consumption. So, yes. uh, so, so that's why, so I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to downplay your point about limits and sort of, uh, safe operating space for the planet is an important question, but I don't, I genuinely don't know, you know, cause for example, there was life on earth when we had 4,000 parts per million CO2. It was very different. We would have no ice at the poles. Sea levels would be really high. Um, we would have tropical plants growing up in the Arctic. Um, uh, and there would be winners and there would be losers in that, in that climate scenario, right? Probably a lot of losers, um, both for people and, and for, for biodiversity. Um, but, you know, some form of life would survive, right? The planet itself would survive. But it yeah. wouldn't be a place that any that you or I or probably most of us could live or would want to live. Um, but yeah. yeah, so so I guess that's you know no, so it's, yeah so it's like a so I guess it's a gradation and yes. or gradation and the 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 you know the less the less the more we do now, the the better things will be and that sure. so, yeah. I'm sorry, that's not a very satisfying answer. No, but... no, no, no. I, on the contrary, on the contrary, because for me, what what you said was exactly what what um, is necessary to hear, in the sense that um, limits in a in a in a system such as Earth is a very tricky thing, mm -hmm. because there is nothing static. Is everything connected? You move one level here, and there is another five that moves without you even knowing. So. I completely agree. It's, it's not that much about the limits and tipping points of resources and chemical process that, that we know of. We need to maintain ourselves within a range. Mm -hmm. um, it's more about the limits of probably our own behavior. And you mentioned mm. a couple, no? Mm -hmm. It's about consumerism. Mm -hmm. That's one of the limits that we should be drawing very clearly. Yeah. Um, and the, the other one, it, when, when you were mentioning about population growth, I, I, yes, I have seen the same, the same uh, information. I, I share completely your, your point. Um, I think it's more about the limits of inequality. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Because, yes. Because precisely the, 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 there is a, a direct correlation between inequality and, for example, population growth. Mm -hmm. when you have a, more, a wealthier country, you have better education. And you have better education, the population starts to slow down, mm -hmm. especially when you educate women. You know? mm -hmm. so Absolutely. You can also talk about limits in gender inequality in, this, yeah. in, that, in, in that aspect. So, well, and, and, and as it relates to that, you know, women bear the brunt of climate change, right, globally. So, you know, the impacts are felt the, so I think today is gender day and COP, at COP26, right? And so this, this is actually really relevant because the there are heavily gendered impacts, heavily racial impacts in terms of, of, of how the climate crisis plays out. And those are often the opposite in terms of, you know, let me say that again, the people who have contributed the least to climate change have suffered the most and the first, right? And so, yeah, so all of those aspects I think are are, are spot on um, in terms of, you know, thinking about uh, what our what our our behavioral or cultural limits yes. are. And another one I would say too is rigidity, right? Being inflexible, being unwilling to change yes. our behaviors, our systems. So not just behaviors at the individual level. I'm not just talking about whether you vote or whether you change your light bulbs, but our, what our society values, um, our lifestyles, um, and, and our sort of social systems. And if you look at, at the archaeological record, the cultures that adapt to change, uh, those are the ones that survive upheavals yes. in the environment. The ones that are rigidly fixed on, no, I'm not changing. This is how, it, you know, this is how we do things. This is how we've always done things. We're going to keep following the same pathways of subsistence and whatever, those are the ones that suffer the most. A diversity um, uh, drives resiliency, no? Oh yeah, I think it's true in 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 people with people and with with the planet. Yeah, and cultures and yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I I I I'm completely on that. Um, is 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 time is flying. The conversation is so interesting. Um, I will I will try now to close with the same questions that I that I do to my other guests. Um, so I, um, again, I was, I was doing my research on biology just to, to have a frame of reference. Um, and the longest living species that I could find was a cyanobacteria that has been going mm -hmm. there for three, more than 3 billion years. So just to think that a, a living organism has been around for 3 billion years is humbling and is, is pretty impressive. Um, so if we humans attempt to even get tiny close to that, um, what will it mean? What, what do you think we should be? It's a very philosophical question, I know, but from, from your, your personal view on, on from your professional and personal view, what would that mean for you? If we attempt to live as long as, for example, a cyanobacteria and have a mm. species for billions of years, what, how we should we even affront that? Should we even try, or should we oh. just don't? That's a that's a good question. But uh, in terms of humanity, if if we want the human species to stick around, and and you know, for those of you who are listening, it's not that we want any one individual human to be alive for three and a half billion years, but rather humanity as a you know, Homo sapiens as a species, right? Yes. Um, to be that successful, and obviously we will change, right? We will. There will be. There, humanity has changed over the million, you know, millions of years of our own evolution. But I think, I think that that should be a goal. I think we should be thinking about, you know, these are relevant. These are politically, personally, culturally, ecologically relevant time scales. And if we, if we think, imagine what the world would look like if we were thinking about planetary stewardship for generations, a billion years into the future. I mean, it would look completely different. We can't even do that for, you know, I, th I think about the, the, you know, the world that my parents left me and, you know, there was a lot that we knew about, about the environment, even then that, you know, the, the people in power now, you know, what are the, the, the decisions that they're making mm -hmm. that are having a negative impact on their own children and grandchildren. And if we can't even, you know, if, if we can't even grapple with those, that short of a time scale maybe we should be challenging ourselves to think a billion, three billion years into the future and, and doing what we can to maintain earth as, as a, you know, as a, as a, a rare 
island in the universe that is habitable. Mm -hmm. And we may never find another habitable planet. We may never find, you know, any place that we can get to. And so, you know, if we want life to continue in the universe, that starts here. And, you know, we should be thinking about that just as much as we're thinking about finding another, another planet, you know, somewhere else in another galaxy. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I I had a really interesting conversation with um, um, an astronomer, and we were discussing Mm. about, you know, the real possibilities of this idea of planet B. And we were talking about, you know, hard physics and, and, and you know, the limits in that, that sense of at least what we know now. I mean, obviously, there are all these theories, wormholes and things, but with what we know now is, is not even remotely feasible. You know, even Mars and all that is, is something that surely we have to do. We have to explore. We have to continue pushing and doing uh, and doing that um, because eventually we will certainly will need to leave this planet. I'm talking about five billion years from now and the sun and all that stuff. That is a longer, longer, longer discussion. But um, I think the 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 immediacy of of what we need to do now in order to maintain our species mm. is much more relevant. And one of I did this same question to this, this um, um, colleague astronomer, and, and she she really responded something that I wasn't expecting, said billions, billions of years is, is just too, too, too much to think about. No, let's, let's just concentrate in the next probably 300 years. Uh, she mentioned something about generations, which also relates a lot to this ancient uh, practice, at least that I've learned here from, um, I'm, I'm in the coast, um, uh, coast Salish uh, nations in the west coast of uh, North America. Um, and the First Nations here have these, these amazingly wise um, uh, custom of thinking on seven generations ahead. Mm-hmm. Whatever is it that you're doing now, you have to think, how is this going to affect seven generations? And seven generations, if again, my maths are really terrible, but it's, it's around 150 years from now, maybe 200 if you want to stretch it a little bit. Um, so yeah, thinking about billions of years in the future is surely something that philosophically we should you know, talk about now and then, but we should certainly be concentrating on something that is, is a little bit closer to that. That was a, a kind of a reassuring yeah. thing that I heard from her. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like, and yeah, I would say like, (laughs) you know, like I said, we can't, we can't even seem to leave a better planet for our children. Um, Let's start there, you know, like let's model that and and practice that. And, and also I think stretching our mind into the past allows us to stretch our mind into the future. We get a sense of these timescales. If we understand, you know, what, what is it about our life right now today that would have been better if someone 20 years ago had made a better decision a hundred years ago, 500 years ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah. A thousand years ago. And, and, and that, that is super interesting because that, that we can connect that with, with knowledge, no, and the production of knowledge. So evidently, um, I don't know, 300 years ago, they didn't know so many things we do now. Yeah. Um, and they surely made all these decisions with the best intentions within their culture, their realization, their objectives, and so on and so forth. We are, we are more or less in the same position. We, it's, it's this crazy thing about we don't know what we don't know, yeah. but we still have the chance to build our cultures and our cities and our uh, planet itself, knowing that we still need to learn a bunch of things and we will get things wrong and that's the second question that i i always do to my my guest is the the importance of failure and mm. getting things wrong for human discovery mm-hmm. is so terrible terrible that that we are getting punished for getting things wrong instead of of being taught how to recover from mistakes Mm-hmm. And and to praise that recovery, I think that's that's something that we should be focusing more on. On how do we recover from mistakes, knowing that sooner or later, bigger or small, we're going to make a mistake. So yeah. especially for scientists and and in your field as well, uh, I would like to hear from you what what is the importance of failure for for discovery and 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 the creation of knowledge. I mean, I don't think you can have one without the other. I think that failure 
is a learning point. It's a moment where it can be deeply uncomfortable. It can, it can be painful. It can be frustrating, but embarrassing. Um, embarrassing yeah. But I, and I think we're poorly equipped. We're not taught the skills for how to fail with grace um, and humility. Um, uh, you know, I tell my students, they get frustrated when they don't know something perfectly. And I remind them, you are a student, you are here to learn. If you knew everything, you wouldn't be here. And the same thing I think is true of all of us. Um, you know, we, if we knew all the answers, we wouldn't be striving, right? We would have nothing to, to learn or to, to, uh, to strive for, to, um, to drive us, uh, to new discoveries. Um, and, and that would be a really, I think, sad and disappointing world to live in. But, you know, I think as we, as we try, you know, fail, failing means we're trying failing means that we are putting ourselves out there. We're making ourselves vulnerable. Um, which I think, you know, I would hope that in our efforts to, to learn, to discover, to, uh, to make things better, we, we would be willing to, you know, to potentially make a mistake or to have something not work out the way that we hoped, um, because that's just life. That's, that's, I think it's, it's inevitable, but I think the important thing is to, to not be defined by our failures, but to, by what, by what we do next. So what happens after that failure? Do we, you know, give up? Do we get defensive and blame other people, throw them under the bus? Do we pick ourselves up, learn from what went wrong, listen, apologize? Um, do we keep going? Right. And that to me is, 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 much more important. Um, but you don't, you don't get discovery. You don't get breakthroughs without failures. It's just not possible because we, we don't, we can't see every outcome. We're not, you know, omniscient. I can't read the future. Um, which means that there will be things that we try that don't work and there will be mistakes that we make because we didn't act soon enough. And like you said, there are the people in the generations before us didn't always know what they needed to know to make a decision that would benefit us now. So we almost certainly are in the same position. There will be things that come up in 50, 100, 500, 1,000 years where they'll look back on us right now and say, wow, if only they had known, right? That that's not an, that's not an okay way to treat people or that's not an okay way to, to live. But when it comes to the climate crisis, we're in a position where we actually know exactly what we're doing and we know what we need to do to make it better. Mm -hmm. And we have this tremendous opportunity. We just have to, to decide to do it. Super. Yes. Well, last question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll finish. And, and the idea with this is, is for you to have fun, to finish with a very positive, <laughs> great feeling after this amazing and, and, and complex conversation. Um, so completely free. Pick the oh, future boy. of your choose, your choosing. No, imagine the future that you would like to see. Tell us first if it's a hundred years from now, 1,000 years from now, or even further down the line. And what will it look like in all possible ways that you can or you want to imagine? I, I really struggled with this question because it's, it's hard for me to, to pick a time scale because my mind <laughs> just keeps jumping around. You know, I think like a thousand, hundred years from now is, you know, is, is really directly relevant. And a thousand years from now, um, you know, I, I want to see what we've become and where, we, where we've taken things. Um, and so, but I've been, I've been reading Monica Burns, the actual star which is a really wonderful book. Uh, it's, a, it's a novel and it takes place um, a thousand years ago during the decline of the Mayan civilization. It takes place right now and it takes place a thousand years in the future with what's happened post uh, the great crisis, right? They talk about climate change and, and extinction and, and the political and social upheavals that we've all gone through. And what I love about this book is that uh, so it's the, the novel has three three different perspectives from these different time periods. So you can see the arc of you know where we're going and and you know seeing the perspective of the Mayan people, not knowing what's going to come and what's going to happen, but recognizing that something's wrong. And the same thing happening in the present, the sort of crisis that we're in right now, recognizing that something's wrong, but not knowing exactly what's going to come and and how we're going to survive. Um, and then seeing this far out future example of what the world could look like, um, has been, has been really powerful to me because, you know, we have to, so, so from that perspective, I think I, I, I choose the, the thousand years in the future. If, if only 
because we need to have something to aim for. We, we need a, a roadmap, you know, the world in a hundred years, I think will look fairly similar to the way it looks now, but in a thousand years, that's when we'll really know how, how did it all play out? Did we, did we do the right thing in time? Did we change our cultures and in, in big ways? Like what are the small actions that we're taking now in terms of making a more just and equitable society and, and how will those play out in, uh, you know, within the next millennium. And, and in this book, you know, there's, um, the, the vision of the future in a thousand years deeply interconnects environmental stewardship and social justice. Um, those things are, are not separated. They're, they're deeply interconnected. So the way that we interact with each other, the way we interact with our planet, all comes from this, you know, the lessons that we've learned in the past, right? And there's this deep emphasis and focus on how can we do better and not repeat those mistakes. And so there's still this connecting thread. It's like, how many things in our world right now that happened a thousand years ago, do we even think about on a day-to-day basis, right? Can you name an event that happened a thousand years ago, right? It doesn't seem relevant to our day-to-day life, but thinking a thousand years into the future, literally everything we do right now is going to make a difference. And so, you know, I, I, in my, in my hope or my, my vision of the world in a, in a millennium, I would, I would hope that, you know, we have found a way to embrace our diversity as people to, to embrace our relationships, our diverse relationships with the planet. Um, and, and to see that those things are deeply interconnected and that they're not separated, that we're not separate from nature, um, to to kind of come back to the kinds of relationships that we had with the earth thousands of years ago, but with all of the information that we now have uh, about about humanity and about um, what's possible um, based on you know, the, the work of, you know, the writers and the artists and the scientists and the visionaries and the activists that are, that are alive and working right now. I want to see what those threads are and how they play out in, in the far future. Um, because, you know, I talk a big talk about the past mattering. And so I want to see, I want to see how our present plays out as the past of the future, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess, you know, the, the past matters so we can draw our future, you know, we can decide our future, you know, mm-hmm. taking, taking that, that learning sequence, I guess. Yeah, and, and, I, and, I, and I hope very much that, that it's, you know, that it's one that we haven't just given up on Earth and that we're not just living in space stations and on other planets and And, you know, because so many visions of the future involve an earth that's just been abandoned to neglect and uh, the, the degradation of the 20th and 21st century. And I, I genuinely, I think we can do better than that. Of course. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm really excited about the science fiction authors that are envisioning those roadmaps that to, to a better world, like people like Monica Byrne or, Mm -hmm. um, Kim Stanley Robinson or other authors that are giving us a sense of what the future could look like if we, if we, you know, if we make a difference now. Excellent. Excellent. That's, that's great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. This was an amazingly interesting conversation. I I have the words to, to, to thank you. Um, And well, that, that's it. That's it for, for this um, episode. Thank you so much. I would like to finish with just a couple of points and a few reflections. I hope this episode was for you as exciting and interesting as, as it was for me. Uh, the conversation was truly extraordinary and I, I've learned so much. The ideas discussed and the knowledge from Dr. Gill was, was truly amazing. Um, there was one topic that I wanted to ask her, but I just couldn't find the moment. Uh, which I think is absolutely essential to understand the uh, relation between human um, uh, action and the climate change. And that is the uh, uh, idea of carbon isotopes. I learned about carbon isotopes uh, while listening to Warm Regards podcast, which is hosted, co-hosted by Dr. Gill. I highly recommend you to, to listen to Warm Regards. It's a very interesting way to learn about climate change. 
from also different perspectives, not only climate scientists, but also artists and other scientists from other fields. So isotope fingerprint is a way for us to distinguish different types of, of in this case, carbon atoms. So although the atoms are the same, uh, they can have different masses, especially because of the number of neutrons in it. And specifically for carbon, there are three types. They are called carbon-12, carbon-13, and carbon-14. Uh, carbon-12 is the most uh, abundant, is 98%, I think. Um, and carbon-14 is particularly important because although they, there are some natural ways that, that this, this isotope is created, um, is also very distinguishable uh, from the fossil fuel, um, burning of fossil fuels. So in that way, uh, scientists have been able to clearly identify that the atmospheric increase of CO2 is dominated by fossil fuels, uh, fossil fuels burner. Uh, because this isotope is, is very, very easy to detect and is very clear to understand the difference between uh, natural cycles and the human impact through fossil fuels. The last bit is just a simple reflection and is in regards of um, how in the natural world everything is connected and everything is interdependent. And the importance of uh, understanding that we humans, we are just another entity in this natural world. We are just another species. In other episodes, we will be discussing what makes us special in terms of being aware of our existence and uh, the civilizations that we have built. But in, in terms of the natural world and the relation between species, we are not particularly important. Um, we have become important in the sense of the effect and, and the changes that we have produced in the natural world. So we, as, as Dr. Gill said, um, seeing ourselves as stewards, being able to understand that it's, it's upon us to ensure that life goes on. And we have that, in that sense, we, are, we have that special place. Connecting this idea with uh, the previous episode with um, Dr. Noyola um, and thinking about the universe, um, just, just final thought is, that we could be the only planet with uh, intelligent life. We could be the only ones with the capacity to ensure that life goes on in the universe. That should be, that's absolutely probable. Um, that should be a very important reason why to see things in a, in a, with a different lens. Uh, to see ourselves as a steward, not only of life in this planet and, and the ecosystems that we depend on, but in general, life. Imagine in a few million years uh, what, what life may have become. It could depend on what we do now. And it's not an exaggeration. It's absolutely possible that that's the case. We have a great responsibility and this is a very exciting time to live. Thank you very much for joining us in this episode and please subscribe and return. There are more conversations coming, some very, very exciting things in the future. Thank you. Future Exploration is produced and written by me, Victor Martinez. Music is composed by Rafael Crux, Udayana Lugo, and Mauro and Daniel Martinez. Future Exploration is licensed under the Creative Commons with attribution and non-commercial use.